Okay, so we've been talking about the fee.org homeworks. And one of the things that people were interested in was Bitcoin. Right? So, <clears throat> Bitcoin. Uh, there's been a big spike in Bitcoin lately. 50,000, 53,000, now what is it? Whatever it is. So, I remember when, when Bitcoin came out uh, about 12 years ago, and uh, I had written a second edition of my book and I exchanged my book for a Bitcoin when the Bitcoin was worth $6. Yep. So, so Bitcoin, uh, what's, his, what's his name? The person who got $5 billion in subsidies to make green cars, bought one point Tesla, bought 1.5 billion in Bitcoins. Some, some, some well-established financial firms are starting to invest in, in Bitcoins, alternative currencies. Now, the problem with calling it an alt-currency is this term currency. So, we're going to look at theories of money and what is money, but the reason we can't really call Bitcoin uh, a currency is because the American Internal Revenue Service declared Bitcoin an asset, which means that if you make capital gains appreciations on Bitcoin, you have to pay capital gains taxes, right? If you if you, if you, if when the dollar depreciates, which we'll look at, the dollar's constantly depreciating, you don't get a reduction in your taxes. Or if the dollar goes up in value, you don't have to uh, pay a capital gains on your dollars, but you do on Bitcoin. So the uh, Department of Treasury declares Bitcoin an asset, specifically so that the dollar, the fiat dollar, and again, we'll look at this, what fiat money is. It's simply not gold standard money. It's only money because the state says it is. Is so that uh, alternative currencies don't compete against the government money. Because if you had competing currencies, Hayek studied this stuff for 50 years. And in the end of his life, the major project was arguing why you need to have competing currencies. So yes, Bitcoin is a competes against the dollar, but it's more in terms of an asset like gold or something because of this declared an asset by the tax revenue people to prevent competition, right? And that's financial cronyism. That's an example of corporatism, not allowing competition. Um, so there's been some studies I saw that they, they apparently did a fiat, or they did an indexing, looking at what potential value could Bitcoin be. Like I said, I bought it about 12 years, or I bartered it. I got about 12 years ago, it was, it was $6, and now it's 50K, let's say. But some respectable financial firm believes that it could go as high as 240k. Now, uh, so my, my personal story about Bitcoin is, uh, well, one thing about Bitcoin is that uh, and alternative currencies, I believe. So if you want to list on the New York Stock Exchange, you list in dollars. If you want to list in uh, Tokyo, you list in yen. But I understand in Switzerland, you can list on the stock exchanges 
with alternative currencies. So there are intelligent countries looking for competition who are allowing the use of alternative currencies as money. And that's, that's Switzerland. So I'm not going to, you should never trust an economist or anyone to tell you what to invest in because they're only doing it for their own self-interest. So I, I can't tell you whether or not to invest in Bitcoin, but I will tell you my story about Bitcoin. Uh, but, and I can also tell you I have been investing in FXF which is an exchange traded fund that buys every single stock in uh, listed in Geneva. So I hedge my, my dollar depreciation with FXF. And I also uh, invest in a, in a Me uh, Mexico exchange traded fund. So now I'm going to tell you my story about Bitcoin. Okay, so I bought, th this is my homepage, CameronEconomics.com, and this is the uh, e-books section. So you'll see that my book, Economics for Everyone, is on here. And when I, I published this uh, in 2010, and at the time, uh, Bitcoin was six dollars, and it, the, uh, the exchanges hadn't been developed yet. I don't remember. The first exchange was Mt. Gox, MountGox.com, and so I met somebody in the park, right, uh, who had Bitcoins embedded, uh, smart chips. So you can probably, I could probably redeem it at a. a at a, a Bitcoin kiosk, but I gave it to my, my dad. So this book I exchanged for Bitcoin when Bitcoin was at six dollars. And right, and that so you can get it. So I sold out the book. I was selling it for one Bitcoin, right? When I started. so I was selling it for a Bitcoin and now the Bitcoin's fifty thousand dollars so obviously I'm not so now I just make it free available here. So then uh, one year, maybe probably the next year or just a few months later, uh, uh, I sent uh, $2,000 to uh, Japan, to the Mt. Gox uh, exchange. And when, when Bitcoin was at 12, and so I, then it doubled in price, I sold the cash and, and kept half of the Bitcoins. And so I bought this for my, my dad and myself. My dad was depressed about the state of the economy, so I wanted to give him some hope. So anyway, Mount, Mount Gox got hacked and then went bankrupt. So it's now undergoing bankruptcy procedures, but I have a hundred bitcoins uh, under bankruptcy procedures in Japan. So that's my. So I can I can't tell you to invest in bitcoin or not. Uh, I can tell you that I did, and I was on the bleeding edge, and uh, they went bankrupt. So I don't know when the you know. I, and I keep getting offered, I'll give you 10 cents on the dollar for your Bitcoin or something like that. But, but that was before the big, big spike. So uh, we've been talking about Bitcoin now and competing currency, right? The uh, Keynesian economics likes to have the ability to print money for monetary easing when you have a Bitcoin, well then, you, you know that printing this money is going to devalue the currency so people would substitute out of that currency into another currency. So, for example, 
uh, right now, this idea of devaluing the currency, when your currency devalues relative to other nations' currencies, that means your exports are cheaper. So that's a race to the bottom, is every country trying to devalue their currency in order to export more. And that's part of the Keynesian fallacy. As long as your currency is relatively stronger than other countries, people will hold your currency and you can continue to import more than you export. So this Keynesian closed equation doesn't take into consideration competing currencies at an international level. And for example, I wanted to show uh, one thing about competing currencies at an international level. This is a, uh, an example. This is um, the, the Swedish krona against the euro. So we mentioned that, this, that the European Union is very large. It started out as a, as a, as a free trade union and then Seoul's rule keeps expanding in power, more and more regulation, more and more trade barriers, more and more special interest groups. England votes to leave. Uh, so, and then the, uh, you mentioned that the Swedish model during the lockdown where they, they didn't have a, a mask mandate, they didn't have a social distancing requirement. People were allowed to act in a local and decentralized manner where Europe, the United States, Australia does not do that. So you'll see that here's the krona uh, was devaluing against the euro. Then you have the lockdowns and then the krona is appreciated against the euro because the up economic optimism was greater in Sweden than it was in Europe due to the way the lockdown was handled. So it's all about competing currencies. So the, the Keynesian idea of paternalism and job creation when you give, again, leading to corporatism. Do you remember the Amazon headquarters too, debacle, where all the different cities and states in the United States were offering Amazon tax breaks to locate there, locate in St. Louis, and I'll give you $2 billion in tax breaks. Locate in Omaha, I'll give you $2.1 billion in tax breaks. Yeah, well, that's, that's called a race to the bottom. Just like you have a race to the bottom to devalue your currency to encourage exports, you have a race to the bottom under the corporatism of crony capitalism, of corporate welfare, a race to the bottom of uh, offering subsidies to um, firms to locate there. And who wins, exporters win, large firms win, who loses, everybody else. That's the seen versus the unseen. Okay, the next uh, feed.org homework uh, people were interested in is why the New York Stock Exchange might flee New York. Uh, well, <laughs> we did a, we've done a hard, okay. So incentives matter. Incentives matter. So when you put on a financial transactions tax, right? Financial transactions tax. Uh, you tax something when you want to discourage it. So. If you put on, if New York State puts on a financial transactions tax, well then, the stock markets are gonna leave New York State because they're not gonna to wanna to pay the taxes. Right, if you put a tax on the wealthy, the wealthy are gonna leave the country because they don't wanna pay the taxes. So why would the New York Stock Exchange leave? Well, if you put a tax on it, they're gonna go somewhere where you don't have a tax. 
So I think uh, Delaware, Florida, and Texas all don't have income tax. Income tax. So this is why people are leaving New York, California, and Delaware, Florida, and Texas, because they have lower regulation, lower income taxes. And we'll be looking at that when we look at how governments can improve economic outcomes. And the answer, the answer to that is by allowing economic freedom. So chasing away the New York Stock Exchange, the financial transactions tax. And then also, then we ask, we, we, we call it financial transactions tax. And then you're leaving, leaving a big open decision on what exactly is a financial transaction. What exchange is not a financial transaction? So who decides? That's the Hayekian knowledge problem. The Hayekian knowledge problem. In Hayek 1945. Who decides how, why, and for what purpose? So you start leading it up to experts and regulators. Who decides how, why, and with what knowledge? But then you start opening a lot of discretionary, a lot of discretionary power to experts. Oh, maybe, maybe real estate won't be a, a financial transaction because, well, the real estate lobby is very strong. In it. Or maybe, uh, so when you leave, leave it open, then you start allowing rent seeking and gaming the system. So that's why we've emphasized negative rights, rule of law, protection from harm, rather than overemphasis on the precautionary principle. Uh, so, so the question is, what is Income tax in New York? Yeah, exactly. How does it work? Uh, uh, what percentage is income tax? I think about 7%. Uh, is that for, the, for the wealthiest, it's about 7%. And in, in the, at the federal level, I think the, the wealthiest pay 23%. And the current administration wants to make it 27% or something. Uh, but yeah, New York has uh, very high taxes. High, high real estate taxes, high income tax, high uh, sales tax. So uh, we've done a hard fire TV show, why people are leaving New York. And this was even before COVID. And the reason for that is because of high taxes and high regulation. People, as people move to Florida, Texas, Delaware, places that have less uh, regulation. So you probably still to work here and have like an average job tax system? Just for New York City, just for New York oh, okay, State. Okay, okay. Oh, um, <laughs> but the, the strangest thing is, if you if you live in the boroughs, the five boroughs, you have to pay a five hundred dollar tax just for the right to live in the boroughs, no matter how much money you make. <laughs> right. So incentives matter if you tax international currency, if you, if you tax uh, trend, uh, financial transactions, people doing financial transactions will go elsewhere. For example, again, Sweden, there was a case that uh, Sweden put on uh, financial transactions taxes in the 1980s, and 60% of the firms that were listed in Sweden then moved to New York. So, and then, uh, so you learn from that lesson. And 
Now, the, the really interesting, where it really gets interesting is when you get to, into international financial capital flows or foreign exchange. Foreign exchange, which is about $5 trillion a day around the world. And there's, so there's no single jurisdiction for that, right? It's not New York, it's not New York City based. Like I wired money to Tokyo or uh, I wired yen to Tokyo to buy Bitcoins to the Mt. Gox exchange. That's an international capital flows foreign exchange tax. That's why the IMF and the World Bank and the UN want international financial transactions taxes because they would be the ones managing and getting the revenues and declaring what is an international financial transaction. And they do it all in the name of stability. Oh, we have to have stability. So we need to tax foreign exchange. So, so the last fee homework I wanted to discuss now is uh, the stimulus, stimulus plan. They're negotiating the third stimulus plan right now. Um, well, the first stimulus plan hasn't even been expended yet. The second stimulus plan hasn't even been expended yet. Yet there's a third stimulus plan. The original stimulus plans were supposed to encourage investment. Bails out, bailouts to the airlines, bailouts to the uh, car companies, the usual cast of characters. Uh, but this, this third time, this, the, the stimulus is, is direct political transfers. The cities, states, public schools, So New York State, New York City budget is $15 billion. New York City spends $15 billion more than it taxes. So now New York City public schools, New York City at state itself, and then New York State itself is getting the stimulus. So it's not even allegedly going to private businesses to encourage job creation. It's bailing out bankrupt municipalities. And the reason for that is, is because California, New York supports the current Team Blue president. So uh, in public schools, in public school labor unions are very, very powerful and big donors. Yes, sir. Good uh, question. Do you think that the unions are too powerful for their own good? Definitely. Definitely. You're going to see a lot of school choice movements going on. Again, that goes back to secession. People are going to secede from the public schools and send their children to, to private schools. Yeah, for their own good. That's right. It's, it's, it, I've never seen anything like the power grabs that are going on right now. It just seems like keep pushing to so the limit. Vaccine. I remember I called in Chicago, like they, they were the huge Chicago apartment on May 2nd. Yeah, vaccine once a guy. Yeah. 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 Well, the, 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 these subsidies are going to the schools whether or not they are. I mean, there's still $500 billion, $50 billion that this, that from the second stimulus that the public schools haven't even spent yet. It's just these huge public transfers uh, because, because the central government has the right to print money and run up debt because of, because of the monopoly currency. So they're just bailing out their, uh, their, their political support. And that, that's called moral hazard. When you create a situation that has negative consequences. That's called a moral hazard. By bailing out the bankrupt new cities and states, you're not encouraging them to reform their budgets. There's no incentive. The bailouts don't provide any incentive for the city and states to balance their budgets, to live within their means. 
because the, the federal government can just create debt and pass it on to their political patrons, right? And then you'll also see uh, one of the secret moral hazard is uh, unemployment insurance. Unemployment insurance. So not, not to mention that they're putting the $15 minimum wage, maybe or maybe not, national minimum wage into the stimulus package, which is going to make a lot of people in poor areas poor. Uh, you're increasing, now, now federalizing unemployment insurance. And what that does is pays people not to work. So we're going to look at what unemployment insurance has done historically. If the idea is to recover the economy, you don't increase unemployment insurance. Right, and the uh, New York MTA, the bankrupt public transport system, is getting a direct infusion of federal money as well. So what this is, this is uh, the labor force participation rate. from uh, leading up so this is the housing boom then you get the housing crash around Jan around 2008 and this is the great recession during this great recession, president, the federal uh, government, is constantly increasing unemployment insurance. Unemployment insurance was supposed to last for three months, and then it lasted for six months, and then it lasted for a year, and then it lasted for two years. So the more that unemployment insurance was extended, the less people who get working in the labor force. And this is called a structural change. You'll see that, so you go from 67% labor force participation down to 63, and it stayed there. So there was no recovery in the labor force participation rate as, as people have been paid to drop out of the labor force. Then COVID hits and bam, we get a, another huge drop in the labor force participation rate. And with a slow recovery, and now it's being extended again, so we, we should see this go, go back down again. And that's really no way to, quote unquote, st stimulate the economy. It does the exact opposite. So anyway, that's just the political hypocrisy that we see. So I guess that's all I wanted to say about those fee homeworks. Good job. Thank you.